we'll just check you can hear us in the cheap seats at the back. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> so hi, I'm Sean, uh, this is Barry, uh, we're going to introduce you to Raising the Bar project, which was a project done in Cumnock in East Ayrshire, which if you're not familiar where Cumnock is, it's down in the west coast. Um, Raising the Bar, we think, was a good play with words. Um, it was about digging up an old pub, but it was also about raising the bar in terms of getting organisations and people to work together on a project. Um, my background is I'm a community development worker for East Ayrshire, and my experience is that <coughs> a lot of organisations in East Ayrshire are very insular, they only work for themselves. And through Raising the Bar, we've seen a lot of organisations coming together. Um, how does this thing work? <coughs> Next. There we go. <clears throat> so the project was um, in September 2013. That is the site. That was what it looked like when the guys from Northlight Heritage arrived. It was a car park. Um, very much on the main thoroughfare of Cumnock, there's a one-way system. Um, so there was a lot of passing traffic, a lot of foot traffic as well. Um, straight across the road from the post office. So a lot of people going past asking what was happening. Um, a lot of partners and organisations as I say involved and I mean we see it now as an asset that brought a lot of people together very much like the pub did when when it was there on the site. Next, oh my god. <laughs> and uh, that we believe is a, a reconstruction of what it should have looked like. Hey, next. So aims of the project um, engagement with stakeholders and the widest possible section of the community in order to develop a project that was suitable to the community's needs. These stakeholders, as I say, included schools, youth organisations and local businesses. It was about developing knowledge of local heritage and the importance of the heritage assets. Cumnock has seen very little investment since the closure of coal mines in the area, which was the main source of employment and taking a different approach to look at the assets can certainly help with the development of that community. It was also about promoting volunteering, uh, offering skills development and promoting experience of personal development. Um, <clears throat> it offer, also offered workshops and activities through uh, such as screen printing, Capture Cumnock where young people design postcards, um, museum takeover days, so one of the schools took over the local museum um, a memory bank and a pub troll to share stories and photographs. There was also online workshops and family history research, all of which were very popular. Um, one particular aspect that I personally enjoyed was the traditional crafts workshop. So we got some hands-on experience of wood carving. Um, this is a bench here. Um, so uh, you can see from the image, Barry and I left our marks on the bench and it now has pride of place in the local shopping centre as, uh, as an art feature. Um, and of course, there's learning about features, um, not just within the site, but round about the site. So um, the street right beside the side the site is called Kiln Home Place. And it was Ingrid that was telling us what a kiln was, because I never ever knew what a kiln was. Um, next, volunteering. So how we got involved in the project. Um, for me, it was uh, an article in the newspaper, that's it there. Um, it caught my eyes. I always had an interest in local history and always wanted to know what things used to be. My idol at one point was Tony Robinson. So I dropped an email through the website. Um, Ingrid got in touch from Northlight um, and said, yeah, we'd love to have you. So I suddenly became the one that was referred to as a stalwart. I was there every day. Um, also, as part of my studies of community development, I've seen it as a great opportunity to get hands-on experience um, of engagement and how to engage with the wider community. Um, so it was pretty much right up our street. So it was definitely thanks to Ingrid and Katie, Charlotte and Peta at um, Northlight. Barry? Um, now, I have to say that I... Okay, now I have to say that I originally approached the project with a certain level of ambivalence because um, I do not come from Cumnock. Um, I live in Ochiltree, <laughs> which is a nearby village. It's a smaller village. 
And I know that people um, in some of those surrounding villages, surrounding Cumnock, uh, resented the fact that so much public money uh, was being spent on projects like this in Cumnock, while vital services in their own villages were being cut and their own community facilities um, were under threat. Um, we have to see the project in the wider context. Um, a great deal of money had been spent um, trying to regenerate um, Cumnock through the preservation and restoration of its built environment. Um, so money had already been spent on the restoration of the town hall, uh, the old church at the main square, and also um, the Royal Hotel. But I was encouraged to participate by a lovely woman called Maureen Murphy um, at East Ayrshire Volunteers. And from a personal point of view, it was uh, right up my street, to, if you pardon the pun. I was unemployed at the time, but I had studied Scottish history at university. Um, and I was, like Sean, I was also intrigued by the title, Raising the Bar, as well as being a clever play in words. It also suggested to me um, the idea of a new start, both myself personally and also for the community. So I put aside my doubts and signed up. I also had to put aside my natural contempt for his uh, archaeologists, which all historians share. <laughs> so um, who else got involved in the project? Well, it was an unusual demographic of volunteers. They were mainly of uh, working age, unemployed, um, not from the town like Barry, but from out outlying communities. There was also a lot of volunteers from public sector, such as uh, local council and uh, job centre plus. And of course, the young people, uh, myself and Barry included in that category, and uh, local school children. And uh, there's some of our lovely volunteers there. Um, just some photographs from the... This image on the left um, was one of the finds. Um, it's either a coin or a token of some description. Um, they dug up Christmas past um, with a couple of teddy bear Santa Claus. And this young gentleman here, it was part of the museum takeover day, so looking at some of the finds and how to evidence and, and log those. <clears throat> Volunteering our personal reflections. I think it's always important that um, we reflect on what we as individuals gain from being involved in such projects. Um, I expected to turn up on a day and be handed a trowel and go hunting for some old Cumnock pottery, gold coins, or even some bones. Um, I was handed a mattock. <laughs> so it's only then do you realize the amount of hard work that happens before you get to the good stuff. And I believe that we uh, moved around 40 tons by wheelbarrow, which was uh, quite a lot. Um, so that I feel that that resonates through the whole project as the good stuff only happens at the end, as we'll discuss later on. Um, getting hands-on surveying and drawing the plans was also very good. And just meeting people and, and being part of something in my community. Yes, uh, like Sean, I have to thank the patience of uh, our mentors, uh, Ingrid, Katie, Petta, and uh, Charlotte. Uh, by and large, they showed a great deal of patience, apart from the odd weathering look when we did something particularly stupid. Now, I personally never uh, learned how to record a find because I found sweet F.A. Um, <laughs> although I did um, help to reveal a wall, which apparently in archaeological circles is considered a great deal. <laughs> but far more important to me than uh, learning any new skill or technique was the validation that came from sharing my time with like-minded people. And the girls showed not only patience, but also confidence in our abilities, and perhaps most importantly of all, trust. Um, it was a pleasure to turn up every morning to uh, contribute to a worthwhile project, but, it was, but also to work with people who assumed that you had a worthwhile contribution to make. Yep. Um, this is just about the wider engagement of the community. Um, one, one very important aspect was um, we actually had the site opened up, so it was just, it was Harris Fence, and as you've seen from the image at the very, the very start, so it wasn't totally blocked off. The council did want big, huge sheets of solid wood with tiny windows for people to look in, but we felt that um, really opening the site up, and as the people were going past, they were stopping, they were sharing their stories. Um, on many an occasion, people would bring photographs of the old pub and um, for us to look at. Um, you would get jokes like, you know, if you find any money, it's mine. 
Um, the bench carving, it was done on the site, so a lot of people going past, you know, they made their mark, and it's it's uh, taken place, in. it's now in the, the local shopping centre as well. This gentleman here um, with the bell, that is the original bell um, to when it was at the end of the night for last orders. Um, so he brought that along for us to see also. Buddy, memory bar. Yes, uh, local people were also encouraged to participate in a more formal way at the memory bank, which was held at the local museum, the Baird Institute. Uh, so residents were asked to fill out forms in which they could describe the pub in three words. Um, this was uh, presented in a graphic. So if we have another slide, yep. the graphic. There it is. So here we have the graphic here. Um, so we have words like friendly, welcoming, um, also dark and gloomy. Um, so you can get the picture. Um, it's dark. It's atmospheric, um, perhaps not the cleanest, um, a bit of a hauf in other words, uh, but much loved all the same. Many of the most vivid memories of the pub um, involved music. Um, people would remember live bands and also discos on the new dance floor in the 60s and 70s. Now, that may simply be a coincidence, um, depending on the age of the respondents, but I believe it also reflects a concrete reality when there was a period of economic prosperity and also social cohesion uh, just before um, Cumnock's economic decline. But the person who described the pub most vividly um, did so not in three words, but in five. So down in the corner, a little image of a cat because the man wrote, the cat peed in his pint, which pretty much <laughs> sums it up entirely. <laughs> oh, no. um, these are just some of the images um, from the art projects. Um, I'm going to go back. So sign writing, what the old signs might have looked like. Children were drawing them. Uh, we got them involved in postcard making for Cumnock. Um, that's local school children carving out the bench and also coaster making as well. So there was a lot of art-related projects going on and activities alongside the, the main dig itself. Now, it was during the Memory Bank session that the idea of forming a new local history group uh, was put forward. It was clear that there was a great appetite and a great interest in local history in coming up, but there was no outlet at the time. So Ingrid and Katie took it upon themselves to act as midwives for the birth of this new group. The driving force behind it was a man called Bobby Grierson. He's there in the middle. Um, he had grew up in coming up, but he had returned, and so he had the passion of the type of man who's tried to reconnect him, uh, with his own roots. And a lot of the people who turned up that day at the Memory Bank session are founder members of the group itself. It's at this point I do have to point out uh, and try to explain a rather unusual fact. Very few of the people, in fact, none of the people who turned up that day and who became founding members of the group actually volunteered for the dig itself, which is rather unusual. And I'll try to explain that. It was perhaps... Um, uh, the nature of the site itself, um, so it was a public site, so um, not a traditional archaeological field site, so the fact that it was in public gaze may have put some people off. It may also be because it was not a public space, um, it was privately owned, um, and it was also run by the council, so perhaps they felt that it was very much a top-down project, whereas the creation of the local history group was very much um, a grassroots project. Now, the formation of the group ran concurrently with the various workshops that were held at the beginning of this year by Ingrid and Katie. And quite naturally, the local history and family history workshops were um, the best subscribed of those workshops. And the two process, processes came together in the final two workshops um, in the early months of this year. And this was where they created a heritage trail for Cumnock. So Bobby and some of the members of the local history group um, came to that workshop. And it was during that process of creating the Heritage Trail that one of the aims of the project sharply came into focus. Because it was during this process that local people had to decide which aspects of their history and their built environment were most important to them. And there was much heated debate as to what to include in the Heritage Trail itself. Um, it also highlighted some of the things that were already missing um, from, from the town, particularly their industrial sites. And I believe it was only then that they began to understand the importance of the gap site that was chosen, because it was only then they understood what had already been lost. But it's probably the most lasting legacy um, of the project. Um, they went from strength to strength, the membership has increased, in the weekly column in the Cumnock Chronicle. Um, so hopefully that will help to reinforce uh, both institutions. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. Yep. Five minutes. Fantastic. No, keep going. <laughs> That's your memory. Now we have, again, we have the Heritage Trail here. 
also have the memory bank session where I'm trying to hide from the photograph, and we have the carving on the bench there. So lots of arts projects. Um, again, we can see the screen printing on the postcards. But uh, towards the end of the dig, Ingrid asked me if I would make my own cont creative contribution um, or creative response to the dig, because I am what you would call a down on his luck writer. Ingrid believed that the gap site with its gentle slope uh, would make a perfect performance venue. And she had hoped that by staging an event on that site, um, the local community could reclaim the space for themselves in a cultural, if perhaps not a legal sense. So she asked me to come up with some ideas. Now, originality is not my strong point. Um, so I joked that originally that the natural amphitheater um, of the site and the fact that the subject was Cumnock would make for a perfect Greek tragedy. But as I studied uh, the site in more detail, uh, I began to look uh, to another literary inspiration. That was Dante's Divine Comedy. So you may, you may see um, we have some Elvises here on the site. Yes, Elvis impersonators. That, the only reason they're there is so Ingrid could tweet that Cumnock had more kings in their car park than Leicester. <laughs> uh, but you can see from the photograph, um, the site itself is stepped in three levels. So the front level where we exposed the original wall has most of the trenches and it didn't take much of our imagination to imagine them as the pits of hell, each uh, inhabited by a particular sinner, uh, the hero included at the time. Now he's helped out of hell um, by Dante's version or, or the version of Dante's virtual, that would be the archaeologist, complete with high-vis jacket and level to measure his progress. He makes his way up to the next level, that's purgatory, um, that was a small very narrow mezzanine level. We believe that's where the toilets were um, <laughs> in the original site. Um, so there he meets people who represent the seven deadly sins, all local characters. And then he then makes his way up to the next level um, where he sees the surveyor. That's Dante's uh, Beatrice, his great love interest, because um, the surveyor was Charlotte and she's French. <laughs> and she shows him around um, heaven um, to the accompaniment of the music of the spheres, and the spheres in this case are a local band. Dante, of course, used the Divine Comedy as a platform in which to criticize and satirize the Florence of his day, and God knows 21st century Ayrshire makes for just as tempting a target. Um, I certainly didn't have to look too far to find sinners with which to populate hell. But I was also attracted to the uh, poem uh, because of its theme of redemption. And again, that's linked to the title, Raising the Bar. So we have the theme of uh, regeneration and salvation, um, both for personal and socially, with an appreciation of the past at its heart. The play at the moment is only an outline form for which I received a small reward. So some of that money did make its way to Ochiltree after all. Uh, but any future performance is, of course, dependent on uh, additional funding, which brings us to our conclusions. Thank you, Barry. Um, so conclusions, we're going to do it individually. For, so one of the, the main things for me was uh, the limited time scale that we had on the project. Um, another week would have been brilliant, and I'm sure that um, that comes across in every archaeological dig, just that couple of extra days. Um, within Cumnock, there's always been a sense of apathy, um, but small projects like this certainly get the community talking, uh, and most of all, it gets people involved. Um, it's, it's certainly been tried and tested, um, and, and it hopefully open up further funding for the area and, and more projects, whether it be heritage related or, or some of the arts that we've seen as well. In terms of future development, um, we, we talked for ages in this one, um, development of uh, the first heritage trail, um, increased interest in the heritage and history through the history group, through the schools, and, and of course, uh, a weekly press release on the history and heritage of Cumnock, which is really a fascinating read. I look forward to getting the local paper every week to see old photographs and old stories. And I think the final thing for me is it's sad that the site has actually returned to the way it was when we arrived. It's been backfilled and, and people park their cars there. Um, I, and I think that sense of 
looking, um, I mean, it could be a good opportunity in terms of the Land Reform Act, which is, is coming into play, and looking at the mismanagement, not just of rural sites, but also urban sites. And it could be a possibility there could be a community buyout there and, and hopefully getting some more funding. And you never know, it could, we could convert it to an amphitheater and, and put on Barry's play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, as I said at the beginning of the project, I did have some doubts, but by and large, I found the project to be a very positive experience, um, even if we didn't make many fines. And I believe the project on its own terms was a success. And certainly such projects can have a positive impact on the restoration of civic pride. But I would caution against those who believe that they can be used as a tool to help regenerate communities that have suffered from economic decline. Um, there are various events have been, and initiatives have been brought up in the last few years, um, arts and community events, um, such as the Cumnock Highland Games, the Mocklin Fair, the Boswell B Book Festival at Auchinleck House, but all of them are heavily subsidised. None of them generate income on their own. And some of those events, such as the Cumnock Highland B Games and Hi Mocklin Holy Fair, have been warned that their subsidy may be withdrawn and are now under threat all of which suggests that any future regeneration of the area must be built, built upon sounder economic foundations. And the very act of archaeology itself reinforces this lesson, because when we dig in the dirt, and notice I said we, uh, we look for tangible material evidence of economic prosperity. No archaeologist, as far as I know, has ever dug up wishful thinking. All of which may make me a hypocrite, because soon after the dig, I got a job as a tour guide at the nearby Dumfries house. Yay. And Sean is well on his way to getting his degree in community development. So, like Dante, we may no longer be in hell, but we have not quite attained paradise. <laughs> which must mean that this is purgatory. <laughs> and no doubt some of you are sitting there thinking exactly the same thing. But don't worry, that has brought us to the end of our presentation. So thank you very much.